there are very, very few cities that have strategies like this. You know, the big sink or swim question, you know, will, will the souffle rise, is going to be whether actually we can get the city to engage and really deliver as a partnership. This is the future of our city, I think we're playing with. You know, I, I think, and I really do believe this, is in the post-pandemic world, the reason people come to cities is for pleasure, for recreation. And food is really fundamental to that. Therefore, if we don't really get our heads around what a delicious, vibrant food city Birmingham can be, then the city itself will fail. Yes, everyone, welcome back to the Birmingham Food Podcast that is Breaking Bread. I'm your host, Liam. Sitting opposite me is my brother from another mother, Carl. All right, how are we doing? All good, man. Don't know why I said all that, all right. Back in the flow, second episode in. I uh, hope you yeah. all enjoyed our last one with the awesome John from the app reviewing. Thanks for coming back. Yeah, listeners. Nice to have listeners. Nice yeah, to have people listening. listening. It's mad. I was saying to you the other night about Spotify's released loads of new figures about how many people actually listen and, and engage with the app and stuff. And it's nice seeing that we're not just screaming into the void, talking know, to nobody. Yeah. Good numbers as well. Like yeah, it's good. Surprising people, people listen to us. It's it's mental. Like we'd do this if nobody listened. If there was Luckily. like one person yeah. sitting at home listening to, we'd probably still do it. Yeah, we love it. We absolutely love yeah, it. Yeah, to have good numbers is like weird as well. Yeah, they don't listen for us. though. it's the guests. The guests. And we have yeah. great. We have guests. awesome guests. Yeah. Where have you been recently? Well, where have we we we've been? We've been. We had one of them weird moments where we booked something separately and ended up booking the exact same thing at the same time. We went to the Black Sabbath Ballet. Yeah, that was great. Really good. That was so good. It's, I mean, it's weird that we booked the same show in individually of each other. Yeah, didn't even talk before. It was just like, what date you got? Oh, I got the Saturday. I got the Saturday. Yeah, me too. Me too. Yeah. Oh, wicked. <laughs> and then we happened to be one row apart. Yeah, that was weird. <laughs> but it was yeah. great, wasn't it? Oh, it was fantastic. I mean. The Birmingham Royal Ballet, they're just, I feel like they're just bringing so much to the city, doing so much exciting stuff, highlighting the city. It's making us a, a, a more of a destination, you know. Yeah. And obviously the Hippodrome is always has wicked shows on. But they, and the Home of, I love Home of Metal. I love what they're doing. I love their podcast. If you can go and listen to their podcast, The Mermaid. It's all about the Mermaid pub that was, well, it's still there, but it's not a pub anymore, up in Spark Hill. Just just go and listen to that podcast. Go find it. It's called The Mermaid. It's fantastic from Home and Metal. They're doing awesome things. But this, how good was the ballet, mate? It was great. It was, you know, my first ballet. Same. same. And, um, Actually, I did you I'd, see that? I'd go again. 80% of the people who booked, that was their first ballet. Yeah, yeah. I was chatting to one of the fellas that runs the ballet. Yeah, that's incredible, that is. That was mine, yeah. Yeah. I was saying to him, like, even if just, like, 10% of that 80% go back and watch another ballet, like, how many? How fantastic is that? Because I'm not joking. I was watching it. I couldn't believe. Like, obviously, you've seen it on telly and you know what they're capable of, but to see them doing it in real life. There's something about being in the room, you get the, the feeling, you feel it, don't you? You yeah. don't see it, you feel it. And it, oh, I mean, it helped that we love the music and that. Yeah, yeah. The Black Sabbath element definitely helped. And the stories of Tony Iommi and Ozzy and Sharon, it was class. It was funny. It was good. It was emotional. It was great. Yeah. And then. We had dinner at the same place, but separate. Oh, yeah, I went for I went before, and you went after, and we yeah. had the exact same order as well. <laughs> we definitely, but then again, I had it first, and that's why I had to tell you. I was like, "Dude, you got to get this." So we went to I went. We both went to Meat Shack, which obviously we've talked about before, and is just it's a phenomenal venue. Yeah, the burgers are incredible christmas it, burger will be coming soon hopefully I you know what? i've got to go and get that i've yeah, never had it let's do that together so i'll do that but no it's, it's good. we both had the special that's on at the moment i think he's thinking of putting it on the proper menu which he's totally yeah. should because it's incredible the korean burger that they're doing yeah unbelievable oh my god korean shack it's one of them I was, as i was eating it i couldn't shut up talking to siobhan about just like this is incredible i can't believe this tastes that good. Like, it was ridiculous. When Carl tells you I think it was the best burger I've ever eaten, you're like, what else are you going to order? Like, I was like, I'm getting that. I've got to get that now. I, mean, I love kimchi anyway. I love all that stuff. Yeah, I love Korean flavours. Mm-hmm. So just to have that. Because in my head, I was thinking all that would work. But I was thinking that would work better on a chicken burger, surely. Mm. So I thought, you know what, I'll try it on the beef. Like, you're only doing it on the beef, so I'll try it on the beef. He knows what he's doing. I'm 
fully trust him to give me whatever he fucking wants to make. Oh my god, it's so good. It was fantastic. Like, Easily the best burger I've ever eaten. Yeah, it's worth going there just to get that burger. That my number one. one. It's, like all the burger, I've tried nearly all of them, and they were all fantastic. But this one just blew me away. Had the nakatomi chicken on the side as well. They were banging as well. Oh, yeah, I love the Didn't chicken. Didn't really yeah. need them though. It's just been greedy. Yeah, <laughs> I was so full. I think I got loaded fries as well. You know. I think I had the normal fries, but yeah, we just went along with it, man. Mm. It was so good. Yeah. Oh, just love Meat Shack, man. Where were you the other night? A couple of so pictures. It, somewhere we were, yeah, we talked about a lot. It used to be Little Blackwood, now it's Le Petit Bois. I haven't been there for a little while. I thought I'd get down there. We had a child-free night, so we were like, this is me and my wife went down. It's such a good place, oh, isn't it? I just, I completely forgot how much I love Ben's food. Like, it just seems to just pack so much comfort and love into it like mashed potato it's simple oh, yeah. but it's the Alligar. best it's the best mash you're ever gonna have well it's, isn't it like <laughs> equal parts like cheese butter and potato yeah just like yeah. whipped together oh my god <laughs> uh, we have had it and it's incredible it's isn't so it? good the lamb was the best lamb i've had in a long long time just melted in the mouth it was superb it was uh, the only downside was when he came over and said so we base the lamb in butter. Uh, we make the sauce with butter, and then we use like half a pack of butter in the mash. So you've probably got a whole pack of butter. <laughs> I was like, I don't care. It's delicious. Oh, and the green beans, mate. Green beans have no business being delicious. No. These were superb. There were almond flakes and garlic butter, and oh, they were just mm. I could have just ate the green beans and been happy. They were the genius and the mackerel incredible. start. Mackerel was superb with uh, heritage tomatoes. Fantastic. And then we shared a creme brulee and banging, banging, really good. Just comfort food. Sophia's service, it's just like, I know we're friends, so it, it is warmer than probably usual. But from day one, she's always been like that. She's always been like, she just radiates hospitality. Just great fun of house, actually. Yeah. Really. Fantastic. One of the best. Fantastic. So, yeah, it's our happy place. We love Le Petit Bois. Definitely worth going. And then they're doing Sunday dinners now as well. So yeah, Sunday dinners. There's this for really well. good one as yeah, well. Great Sunday day. Get the Alligot. I feel like he should give like a, a bowl of Alligot on the side to anyone who comes <laughs> for in. Anyone that goes in, yeah. It just should come There's a few like, places doing that. good Sunday lunches as well now. Yeah, there is, man. Um, I don't know why tops. I said it like that. I don't know why I went all New Zealand. <laughs> There's some really good places now. Tough 670 again. Yeah, Tough 675. quid. Three courses. Yeah, that's Jeez. mad. And then Toffs in Solil, like, by all accounts, it's, like, their normal food's fantastic. Mm. I've eaten it. It's great. Yeah, the wolf. But everyone's telling me their Sunday dinners are incredible. Everyone's banging about the wolf. The wolf Sunday dinners, yeah. 670 ones we just mentioned, like, I was chatting to Cray about that, and he says, that, like, getting a table's, like, it's like yeah. gold dust yeah, at the moment got, for I've his tried. Sunday dinners. I've they tried. look good. Yeah, I've yeah. tried. I couldn't get one. Cool, man, sir. On to today's episode, I don't want to go too much into what we've been eating because this is, it's a long, interesting, fascinating, important episode. Uh, I felt quite a lot of pressure doing this episode because it's a complicated subject. I mean, it's a 25 year plan or something like that. We're talking about the Birmingham food system strategy. I mean, the book is, a, it's a great book. You can download online, you can go see it, but I just want to bring it to more people because I feel like sometimes with the council, they do stuff and it gets stuck in the walls of the council building or online. And most people don't get to hear it. And that's what I feel like our job was to do was to sit down with, I mean, to sit down with Dr. Justin Varney. I mean, we, we've heard him talk, do a few talks now. Incredible speaking. Yeah. We've been to some of the lunches they've done at the uh, college. Yeah. So basically, Birmingham is reimagining its relationship with food, and that's in every aspect. And it's as big a subject as it sounds. It's complicated. He obviously. explains it so much better than we ever could. Yeah. Like, you yeah. know when you're talking to someone really intelligent, because they take something really complicated and they make it sound so simple. Yeah, yeah. And I still can't get anywhere near the level of descriptive no. language he uses, but in a simple way as well, yeah. which like... No, I, mean, I, re I read the whole strategy and it, it just managed to simplify it way better than the book does. When it takes hold in the city and really like takes off, game changing. Like there's a couple of cities already trying it in Europe, but we're like the flagship one and we're really pushing it. And when it all comes off, and I'm sure it will, it's going to really change the quality and how we think about food in the city. Yeah, it 
change the food quality. Like change, just change everything. Yeah, I can't stress how important. Yeah, this is, is moving forward and how fantastic Justin is. Is just incredible, and his whole team's got a massive team yeah. behind him helping him do all this. And like I know there's issues with the council and funding, and I, but I don't think this. I think this money was earmarked, and I think it's yeah. it's all still going ahead from what I can tell. Yeah, just listen to what he says, Director of Public Health. It's really cool, important dude. Obviously, thanks for listening. If you do enjoy this episode, all we need you to do is do one thing for us. If you could just tell a friend, tell a friend. I listen to this awesome podcast about food in Birmingham and we have awesome guests. Do that for us and we will love you forever. It's something that we've just loved making and yeah. been a part of. Obviously, we have a lot to get into and mm. I'm, I'm like mad keen to get your views and everything on everything. But if we just start off by going to your role here at the council if you want to tell us a little bit about about that and how you got to that position yeah so i'm director of public health for birmingham city council so my job is to protect and improve the health and well-being of the people that live in birmingham and that's about 1.2 million people um and that covers a whole range of things so most people will know me as the kind of voice of covid in the city uh for the last couple of years um but in normal times that kind of health protection piece infectious disease response is probably in about 10 percent of my job um i also commission the drug and alcohol services for the city sexual health services run campaigns on healthy eating on physical activity commission smoking cessation so i have a budget of about 100 million a year which comes from government as a you can only spend it on public health things uh, and i have a team of about 120 staff now Um, So it's a reasonable size team. Um, And I joined the council back in 2019. So I came from six years as the national lead for adult health and wellbeing for England at Public Health England and uh, moved up to the city and now live in the city as well. So no, just work here. I live here as well. Mm. (laughs) Which bit do you live in? Uh, So I live in the cube by the mailbox. Now I wanted to live, when when we moved up here, I started living down uh, by the Arcadian um, and we started kind of house hunting and I really wanted somewhere that was by the canals I think one of the great joys of Birmingham is the water mm. um, and I like to be able to walk to work because <laughs> um, I think when you work long long hours it's it's a luxury and it's brilliant I'm 10 minutes from everything and you know there's so much going on in, in the city it, it is a real pleasure uh, to live here so I feel now I've become a kind of adopted brummy um, <laughs> not just because of you know working through COVID but it is it very much feels like home now actually you've had a few people say it's quite welcoming when people want to make their home here people mm-hmm. are quite happy to have people and integrate them and in. oh definitely it's the only city I think I mean you know I lived 20 years in London um all my almost all my adult life before coming here was in London in London, nobody really belongs to London. Even if you're born in London, you're not really a Londoner. It, it doesn't really exist as a concept. Um, I think if you go somewhere like Manchester or Liverpool, if you weren't born there, you're never going to be uh, a Mancunian. You're just never going to be accepted that way. Whereas I think Birmingham's always been a city that it doesn't matter where you come from. If you kind of believe in the city, then the city will believe in you. And I think that's something quite unique to to Birmingham, actually. It's one of the things that that makes it such a, a great place to live and be. I think we're just glad, <laughs> glad and, and a little bit surprised that people want it because we're so like, oh, you know, it's Birmingham, it's just Birmingham. Like so when people a, choose to be here, we're like, yeah. I chose to be here. <laughs> I think it had a reputation for so long of having nothing really here that when everyone did come, they were well, like, yeah, come on, we need some more people. Come on, get involved. So, yeah, so my, my mother grew up in Netherton near Dudley. And oh, no, Neverton, yeah. I used to come here, I maybe came here two or three times when I was little. Spent more time going to Dudley Zoo to see the penguins. <laughs> and um, then I came probably twice for conferences over the years and then came for the job interview. And when I came for the job interview, I did the first part and then I had a kind of lunch break and I went into the gallery around the corner and there was an exhibition on women in protest. And on the back of the gallery there was a, a, a wall of knitted boobs uh, and sat in front of it was this multicultural group of school children. There were 
young girls in hijabs, you know, really diverse representation of Birmingham and they were sitting and they were pointing at the wall and they were having this conversation and I was like this is my city <laughs> this is this is a vibe I gel with and but when I came here I was really astounded this is a city in which you know we talk about it being England's second city but it behaves like the handmaiden you know it's not like Manchester or kind of fur coat and not a lot underneath it's you know there is this thing Birmingham kind of feels it's got to have all the boxes tick before it raises its head and goes we're proud and there are loads of gemstones across Birmingham but not a lot of jewellery and it's Mm. it's the wiring that joins us up but we have moments of brilliance and I think the Commonwealth Games really started to change the narrative of the city and and started to get people to really see it as a global city which is brilliant Mm. Uh, it's one of the great bits of living here Oh, everyone was so proud of the Commonwealth Games. Like, I think we kind of half expected it just to be a bit rubbish. Yeah, like, I thought it was just gonna. There's no roof, so it's gonna rain every yeah. day. And... and then the open ceremony, and it was hard not to sit there and just burst with pride. Yeah, like, this is us. This is Birmingham. This is yeah. And the and, and I think you know when when we went through the Commonwealth Games, everyone just walked that little bit prouder little bit taller but also it wasn't just about the city centre and I think that was the other thing that I thought having lived through London in the 2012 Olympics um, and I didn't live in a bit of London that had Olympic stuff going on but I did work in part that did I didn't feel it was connected whereas here you know we were going down to the university to watch stuff we were down doing arts down in Longbridge we were all over the place nipping up to Sutton Park, you know, all of those things. And it really felt like actually they worked hard to get the city engaged and to try and make it about the breadth of the city and the diversity of the city. And that, you know, that was brilliant. I think particularly after we'd had a really rough COVID. So coming through, it just made it all a little bit more special uh, and a great way to celebrate the city. And it did. And it it took us to a kind of national stage as well. I remember listening to Five Live on the way to work and it had, uh, I think it was Steve Bunce, the uh, boxing. And he was like, I've had a great week in Birmingham because he was doing the commentary for the uh, boxing, obviously. And he was like, I walked from the city centre down to a place called Selly Oak to the (laughs) university. So I met loads of great Brummies. Everyone's really hyped. And it's like, when do you hear people talking positively about Birmingham on national radio? Like, well, no. I, I feel it's the same. You know, it's a bit like when a CJ Rayner writes something nice about one of the mm. restaurants in the city. Yeah. And part of me kind of goes, please don't tell the rest of the world. <laughs> yeah. um, I like being able to get a reservation. Um, <laughs> but on the other hand, it kind of goes, well, actually, this is really important. You know, there are great places across the city. We have a world class ballet, we have amazing theatre, we have some of the best contemporary artists and, and places like the Icon you and with amazing chefs and amazing food and part of i think birmingham's handmade in behavior is we want to kind of keep the secret to ourselves <laughs> yeah. you know if everyone else starts to suddenly realize there's great stuff down in sturchley then we won't be able to get a table anymore um yeah. you know so it's a bit of a balancing act but you do see birmingham appearing more now um, in national press and and people coming to Birmingham and going, oh, it's not quite the 1960s ring road that I thought mm. it was. And I think that's starting to change. And the Commonwealth Games was a really important part of that. And it, it, local Brummies are changing their opinion too. It's like Tom said before, if you can't get local Brummies to change their opinion of, the, of their own city, how can anyone love it, you know? And I feel like that kind of changed after the Commonwealth as well. Yeah. And well, I think a, a lot of it was also people in cities tend not to leave the bit they live in so because of the nature of cities and you see this most acutely in london is you can do everything you need within about four to five miles of your house and unless your work takes you somewhere else and even if it does you might just get on the train and go there so you'll never stop and pass through and i certainly know uh, local brummies that i have more detailed knowledge of the city than they do but you know, I spent, during COVID particularly, spent a lot of time whipping around the city to look at testing sites and go and make sure that I understood what it felt like to experience the pandemic if you were living down in Small Heath compared to what it was like over in Oscott. Because what we have on the high streets, what people experience in their lives, very different. And it's all very well for me to kind of sit in the city centre and go, yeah, I can get box deliveries from the wilderness tomorrow and that's great. And, you know, Actar's around the corner, give me a curry, that's brill. <laughs> yeah. um, 
It doesn't work like that if you're out at the far end of North Edgebaston. You haven't got the same richness in your high street. So it was really important for me as part of my role to actually know the city. Um, but I'm always astounded when I meet people that live here that have never gone down to Longbridge. You know, they've never come south of Erdington. Oh, um, we we know people that we say, oh, we're going out in Sturchley. And they're like, Sturchley? Mm-hmm. You're going out in Sturchley for? You're like, because that's where everything is now. <laughs> I was saying to someone over there about Kings Heath being like one of the most up and coming mm-hmm. neighborhoods, yeah. and like how house prices are so high. And they were like, Kings Heath? <laughs> You're joking. <laughs> and I was like, no, Kings Heath is the place, I'm telling you. But absolutely. <laughs> and you go down there, I mean, you know, to the arts and craft market they've got mm. in Kings Heath now, that little garden center with a cafe, it's yeah, just a gem for a Sunday morning brunch. And but again, I kind of feel bad saying it because I'm kind of like, no, don't, don't keep the secret. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> <laughs> and you know, and every time we're finding, we were up in um, over in Bearwood having uh, Sunday lunch the other week in a cafe, and I was like, okay, you would never, you would have never known this driving past that this amazing cafe was serving brilliant locally sourced food at incredibly affordable prices, and it was packed, and we were there like five seconds after they opened <laughs> to get our table. <laughs> You know, that's not what people think about when they think about eating out in Bearwood. Mm. And, you know, that's, I think, one of the joys we're seeing in the city at the moment actually is that it's a great place for people to have a go, to innovate and to start up. And whether it's in food or whether it's in technology, you know, I mean, the, the company that makes the digital gummy vitamins that are printed in layers yeah. is based down in Digbeth. Yeah. It's like that was invented in Birmingham. Yeah. You know, it's not just custard powder that we made. <laughs> um, all of that is, you know, these are all the great things that make the city fascinating. There's always something new to go and explore. Today's episode mainly is about the food system strategy. It's kind of how we come across mm-hmm. you uh, through the dinners that we mm-hmm. had at UCB. They were brilliant. Some of the speakers, including yourself, were Thank fantastic. You. Um, how did you become involved with the system strategy? So um, so I came to the city in 2019 and we didn't have a food strategy for the city. Mm. And that's not unusual. Um, you, in the UK, there are still only probably four or five cities that have a food strategy. Uh, and we're now one of them. And uh, when I arrived, um, we were part of a thing called the Milan Urban Food Policy Pact, which is a global network of about 200 cities across the world who work on food stuff, food systems work. And because of that, I had to go to a conference in Montpellier in France. Um, (laughs) I know, that's the thing. It sounds like it's going to be really hard, you know, hard life. I have to say, and and people won't believe me listening to this, when you do work conferences, you basically get off a plane, go straight into three days of meeting and get back on a plane. The Milan ones are slightly better because they at least arrange at least one outing to go and see a food place, et cetera. Anyway, we're in Montpellier and it was me and uh, Councillor Hamilton, Paula Hamilton, who was the cabinet member at the time. And we were in a talk being given by um, Montpellier who were talking about their kind of food strategy. And she turned to me and went, can we have one? And I was like, "Uh, okay, yes, Councillor. Um, because you know she's my political boss um, and she said uh, how quickly can you do it and I said well 18 months and she said can I have it in six <laughs> and we kind of compromised on a year and then um, and so we started work to develop strategy and we based it on the learning from Milan and Milan is like the world global leader on food system thinking and they have this wonderful diagram of how a food system works. So you know, it goes from food production, growing food through how it's transported and then how it's transformed and then how it's sold and how we eat it uh, and then how we throw it away. And their version of the world is this giant spaghetti diagram, which kind of joins all these connections up. Our version is kind of a circle, <laughs> uh, slightly simpler. Um, but we use that as the basis. And then... Um, what would have been 12 months became actually two and a half years because of COVID. But it was one of the two pieces of work that Councillor Hamilton asked me to continue to work on during the pandemic. So through that, we created a dedicated food team and we started to build the strategy and do a lot of co-creation. We did a lot of focus groups. We went out and asked um, care home residents, for example, what do they think about food? 
you know, when we think about food, we often think about our high-end restaurants, which are brilliant. But we don't think about people who live in institutions that get served whatever every day. And so we ran a lot of focus groups. We ran surveys, all of that through, um, and then co-designed the strategy, uh, which we've now launched. And that provides a framework for us to creating a healthy, sustainable, diverse, economically vibrant food system in the city. And what's brilliant is we won an award for it when it was in draft, um, <laughs> which is great because it's like an international award on food documents. Um, so, so that that I took as like a great big tick. And now we're in the phase of we've published it, so now let's make it real. And and it doesn't shy away from some of the really hard stuff. You know, too many people in our city can't afford to feed themselves or their families. Um, and we've been working with the food banks and the Food Justice Network on that. We have a great, vibrant food sector with restaurants and bars, but they're struggling. They're struggling to survive. I and mean, this is a really brutal industry. In other areas, we're kind of saturated by unhealthy fast food. Um, and how do we manage that in a way which doesn't lose jobs, but helps those businesses create a better offer? And then you, know, the, the other aspect of this is we are a global city. Not everyone wants to eat fish and chips in a white British diet. Um, and particularly when we talk to families who were struggling with weight issues and they said, you know, there's no point sending us to Weight Watchers because we've got to walk down this high street every day and there's not a healthy option on it. Um, and some of us come from communities where we want, we know what healthy looks like in the context of our Ghanaian diet or our Pakistani diet, but the produce we need to cook that is unaffordable. So the strategy is about all these things and trying to change that. And we're just starting that journey. How do you kind of tackle that without kind of stamping down on businesses, like food businesses? Well, I think, first of all, you do it with businesses. So, you know, I was meeting with the Chefs Network today, actually, talking about how can we work better with food businesses? How can we have a better conversation? Traditionally, food businesses kind of only talk to the council around enforcement when they're in trouble or when they're trying not to be in trouble, uh, and paying their business rates. Um, and there hasn't really been a communication or much of a conversation before. I think the other problem we have actually in that space is that the food industry in the UK doesn't have a very good voice. So when you look at government policy about food, it's not very good. Frankly, it's not. It doesn't really think about food business. We don't think about food in the same way we think about engineering. Yeah, even though I think... I think the hospitality sector is bigger than the engineering sector. Absolutely. When you look at what creates income for cities, you know, if Birmingham didn't have bars and restaurants, we would not be an economically viable city, <laughs> yeah. you know. You wouldn't have me either. <laughs> <laughs> it's, you know, it, it's a really important part of what makes us a city. And the challenge is that um, the voices of these businesses are not often heard and, we don't talk about career paths in the industry. Um, you know, one of the things I was talking to the Chef Network about was the work they've been doing on raising issues of mental health in, in hospitality. And you know, those are conversations, if we were talking about manufacturing, they've all got occupational health departments. You know, there's a, there's a whole industry sector that works around that. We talk about that in the context of, of food and hospitality. It's predominantly independents or chains, but chains with franchises. They don't have access to occupational health. Actually, career paths are much more kind of chaotic, less well structured. You know, people burn out in the industry very fast because it is an intense industry to work in. And we should be investing in that. That's a really important part of our city. It's part of our culture. It's part of our heritage. So, yeah, so we, we do need to work with business. And there are things where we know we've learned from other areas. So London did this great project where they supported corner shops to start to sell healthier products. But what they did was say, you know, we know you can't take the risk on a new product line. So let's say we want you to stock um, almond milk, for example. Well, if you're a small business, the risk of buying six crates of almond milk is a lot of money to lay out if you don't know your punters are going to buy it. So what they did was they bankrolled six months of trialing a set of healthy products. And what they show, and then at the end of six months, the business decided whether they want to keep product or not, but they were then on their own. Now, 
over 80% of those businesses kept six or more products on the shelves after the trial because they had confidence that their their shoppers were going to buy the products. And that meant in these businesses, healthier food was available and it was affordable. So it's those kind of things that you work with business. It's not about telling business off. It's about saying, we want you to be successful, but we also don't want you to kill people. So, you know, let's work together on finding a way through this. Because that obviously shows that there is demand for those healthier products in those areas and stuff as well. We had it before. We had uh, Urban Herbs just, mm-hmm. just on the podcast and he, he was growing pak choy. So I mean, he was saying, look, anyone can grow pak choy. And then he had loads of negative people, like loads of negativity saying, people on hard up incomes, they don't want pak choy. And it's like, well, how do you know what they want? Like, maybe they do. Maybe they've never tried pak choy. Maybe they'll try it and think it's delicious, you know. But, but I mean, you know, I, I mean, I love urban herbs. And uh, although I, he introduced me to the tree spinach, and now it's just seeded across my balcony. <laughs> <laughs> but, but on the other hand, I get Vietnamese coriander from them, which I really like. So, you know, trade off. We did some really powerful work with the Poverty Truth Commission in Birmingham, um, which is a, a project led by Thrive Together, um, where we bring together people who are living in poverty in the city with people that are writing policy. So that you're not writing policy in a vacuum. You're actually sitting down with the people who are going to be on the other end of it and going, what does this mean? I was at a session with people that lived off food banks and it was great. I remember one woman said, you know, I don't need another damn tin of chickpeas. Like every week I get a, like three tons of chickpeas. She said, but people don't think about what I'm having to create. I've got three kids and I get a bag which has, she said, one week I got a celeriac. She said, I know what to do with the celeriac, but I can tell you that 90% of the people using that food bank wouldn't know how to cook a celeriac, mm. let alone, you know, doesn't mean that they couldn't. It's just I needed a recipe card with it saying, this is how you treat this ugly thing. <laughs> and you, how you turn it into something yummy. Um, and one of the things that is important is that we don't deny people choice because one of the things those people really, really landed with me when they said it was one of the hardest things about living off a food bank is I don't get to choose what I eat. I get a bag of food which someone else has packed that I have to try and work out how to eat. And sometimes that means I have a tin of tomatoes and that's all I have because no one put any herbs in the bag and I don't have them at home and I don't have the money to afford them. And that really kind of was really powerful to hear actually how hard it is and and how dehumanizing it is when you don't have choice. So you know, one of the things we did during the Commonwealth Games actually we had a project on herbs and spices and they were doing all these cookery demos around cooking for different Commonwealth countries of heritage. And so at the end of it, they had like 150 spice jars with different spices in. And they were like, well, what do you want us to do with them? We're like, give them to the food bank. Give, put spices and herbs into the food bank. Because actually just adding a little bit of paprika to something can completely change that tin of tomatoes or that tin of chickpeas into something that's way more interesting and a bit more palatable. So I'm all for, you know, letting people have pak choy if that's, you have a go and try because they should have the right to try it. Yeah. And, you know, that's some of the inequalities of food we don't we don't talk about enough. Yeah, something we don't even think about. What's meant by regenerative food system? So a regenerative food system. So it's about a food system that basically regenerates, that continues. It's this idea of kind of a circular economy, that the food that we eat that we throw but more importantly the food we throw away goes back into the food system and all the food that isn't purchased so there are different ways of kind of thinking about it so um huge amounts of food are wasted um every day in the city because we all like to walk into a shop and see a whole shelf of sandwiches not all of those sandwiches are going to be eaten mm. So you actually think about how does that plow back into the food system and whether that's those sandwiches go at the end of the the day at five o'clock, go to a homeless shelter and feed people as part of their evening meal, or whether they are mulched and turned into biomass and generate energy that then powers a hydroponic farm, or whether they are 
given as chicken feed because apparently chickens eat almost anything. Um, so <laughs> I was in a, a in a, a farm restaurant the other day where they were telling me about how much the chickens will eat of what's left over. Um, but so it's about having that, but it's also about having a food economy that kind of builds on itself. So it's continually evolving and developing and growing. And one of the challenges we have in the way that we approach this kind of work is we often have non-recurrent money. So we're great at kind of funding a pop-up. And, you know, that example of the corner shops is a good example of that. Of You've got non-recurrent money, so you can run it for a while. And there was a big project on this in London ages ago where they pumped money into putting fresh food into the corner shops. But the money ran out. And when the money ran out, the fruit ran out. And so you have this cliff edge moment. So really thinking about regenerative strategies around thinking both around that circular economy, but also how you have a system which is continually kind of growing and evolving on its own steam, rather than continually needing injections of cash. And that can be about how we educate people. It can be about how we create growing spaces in the city. You know, if we can help more people to grow a pot of cherry tomatoes on the windowsill, each of those little cherry tomatoes is a, like not just a flavor bomb, but it's a bomb of vitamin C. That's great because too many of us don't eat a multivitamin and don't actually have a balanced diet. And, you know, one cherry tomato a day would just take that little bit healthier. So he's thinking about different ways to make that system sustainable. It's so one thing we don't really think of is the nutrition of like, especially when you grow your own, it's probably far more nutritious than say the cheapest tomato in the supermarket highly likely no i I see i disagree a little bit and it's interesting because you know i and this is where i'm kind of a fan of jack monroe it's kind of going actually we've got this whole psychology that tinned fruit and vegetables and frozen fruit and vegetables are somehow less nutritious than those i mean the reality is that very few of us have the luxury to go dig out the garden and cook it in five minutes Mm -hmm. You know, I certainly don't. Most of us don't have that luxury. I think frozen's better though, isn't it? I've heard frozen's pretty good because it's frozen pretty much as soon as it's picked. So frozen, yeah, frozen is is really, you know, what we're finding is now with the new technologies, you know, food is frozen pretty fast. Mm. So you don't leach out, you don't lose any of the nutrients. Yeah. Tin stuff, as long as it's not sat in a pool of syrup, yeah. <laughs> again is being done very very quickly and they're doing it quickly because in essence that helps the food taste nicer and be healthier so you know i i was always struck i was doing work back in london a, a few years ago and someone did the nutritional profile of of what i you know veggies bought in iceland versus veggies bought in waitrose and there is no difference the frozen veggies are they look prettier one than the other but there's no actual nutritional difference yeah so i i think we get a little bit too obsessed with it how quickly it came off the tree yeah and the other thing i would just mention is have you come across apple hotels no so we talked about so this, yeah, this is something i learned from copenhagen so we had to, we've been talking copenhagen do some amazing work on food school food procurement so they've been teaching us how they how they've got more fresh fruit and vegetables and more um, locally sourced fruit and vegetables into school meals and one of the things they were telling me about was this thing called apple hotels so i thought the apples in the supermarket have been picked off a tree like last month yeah what actually happens is apples get picked off a tree and then they get put in big trays and they go off to an apple hotel and an Apple hotel is a giant warehouse filled with an inert gas. So something like neon, for example, which doesn't change the apple. It basically puts it in suspended animation. Mm. They can stay in Apple hotels for five years Wow! What? before they end up on your plate or in your bag at the supermarket. And the problem with the Apple hotel is although it is kind of inert, there is nutritional degradation. So the apple gets less good for you the longer it's in the Apple hotel. But when I was at the wholesale market a few months ago, one of the traders was explaining, you know, he had bought limes from I think it was Brazil or Argentina that would take four months to arrive. And they were similarly in a, in a cargo container. So they'd been picked, kind of not quite ripe. They would go in a container of inert gas. They would come across and then eventually they'd land here and he would unpack them and then they would ripen in the, on the stall in effect. 
Um, so yeah, so I think there's a Apple Hotels for me was a really big shock. Yeah, I'd no, heard of it. I'd no, never I heard of it because they do it with not just apples; it's mm. with everything. Yeah, I've heard of it before. It's just it threw me off when you said apple. But yeah, yeah. I'd seen them. Um, I think it was during COVID they were talking about how we've still got lots of fruit and veg, even though there's a lack of um, pickers and uh, well, all ports had come to everything come to a standstill, hadn't it? Yeah. The downside of it though is that in some so it, it's, it's often used for hard fruit, I think, more than soft. Um, but I do remember during COVID that we'd had an outbreak on a farm down in Herefordshire um, that produces the bulk of the country's broccoli. So there was, and it was like a national DEFRA level alert because if that broccoli didn't get picked, there would not be broccoli in the UK for like three months. <laughs> um, and then you suddenly realise broccoli is actually in lots of things because I don't really think about broccoli other than as a side dish. You know? um, but all of these things like vegetable quiches that you get in the supermarket would have to be reformulated because broccoli is quite a good bulker. Mm. So there's all sorts of different things that we don't always know about the food system. And that's one of the great bits of doing this food strategy is I, I have developed a little micro expertise on <laughs> food systems and, <laughs> and how this, you know, when the Ukraine war happened, um, actually understanding that the big impact was Ukraine sells cheap wheat to Brazilian beef farmers, for example, American beef farmers, because they buy the Ukraine wheat, the wheat that low middle income countries in Africa buy, they can buy from the Americans because the Americans don't sell their wheat to feed the beef cattle. You cut off the beef cattle's wheat, they then need to get the next cheapest wheat, which is what was feeding Africa. So this whole interconnection, and then you add in the dimensions of, of oil and you know, those elements of things. And we are way more connected as a world when it comes to food than we like to think. Um, and again, that's part of why when we did the food strategy, we are working on a global stage as well, because we, you know, the stuff we can do as a city and then the stuff we have to talk with others and, you know, and learn from others. And, and that's a really important part of being part of this global network of cities in this space. Is a big part of this going to focus on schools as well? Because the kids, we had it with the Herb podcast we did the mm. other week. He goes into schools and does things mm. with them. And he says the kids' minds are just blown mm. about how you can grow things and how easy it is actually to do. But my daughter goes to school, she gets fed. and She often comes, what did you have for dinner? Pizza. What did you mm. have today? Hot dog. I'm like, oh, God. Yeah, so one of schools is this interesting space in that I think – one, the, the council has quite limited powers when it comes to schools. So since they became academies, you know, what, what we used to be able to do 20 years ago and what we can do now is quite different. So schools all get to choose who they buy their catering from. So Birmingham is quite unique because it still has this thing called city serve. So we still serve, and I forget how many tens of thousands of meals a day in the city to schools, but about 40% of the schools in the city buy their school meals from CityServe, and that is predominantly locally sourced. It's cooked in the city and it's served in the city. But there are lots that don't because the school budget is fixed. You know, they sometimes have to choose between, do I serve the bare minimum nutritional standard, which is set nationally, and I can afford another teacher? Mm -hmm. Or do I have something that's, you know, more beautiful, more interesting, but I can't have another teacher? because that's the choice I'm having to make. And I don't envy heads. I mean, heads really have a really tough time making those budget decisions. So there's, there's that kind of challenge of it. National government set nutritional guidance um, on what can and can't be served in meals. And that is a national decision. There's limits that we can play on that. And a lot of that changed after the Jamie Oliver work. Um, but, you know, there are many chefs that have tried to kind of influence school meals. And it's really hard to do. I think where there's more mileage is about engaging children and young people in the joy of cooking and growing and eating. Um, you know, and it, it's a bit like the Pak Choi um, bit, how frustrating it is or how sad it is to meet kids whose diet is basically beige, who've never really been exposed to Pak Choi and aubergine, a cour you know, even a courgette. It's not because their parents are making a decision not to. 
It may be that they just can't afford to, it's not available to them, or their parents were raised on a beige diet. And, you know, it's, I've got a friend who lives in Erdington. He'll kill me for saying this. <laughs> and then um, every time we go to a house party at his, all the food's beige. It's like chicken nuggets, potato wedges. And the last party we went to, I was naughty. I took a bag of courgette. I took courgette, a cucumber, and a big bag of cherry tomatoes. And I, ch- I found a chopping board at his place, chopped it up and put it out on the buffet table. <laughs> and I had friends coming up and going, did you bring the vegetables? Thank you. <laughs> and so we went to a party at his last week and he sent out a, like a note to everyone on the WhatsApp group going before, going, just before Justin starts, I'm going to inform you there will be more colours at tonight's buffet. <laughs> but, you know, that that's the way he's been brought up. That's the way he lives. And, and you know, for him, the food he is most comfortable with is what I call beige. It's high carbohydrate. It's ultra processed. Um, you know, that is his reality. And then suddenly I come along and introduce a crudite. I think with children and young people, um, I think the more that we can help, and and I think it's the more we can help outside of school time, actually, because I think teachers are highly pressured at Mm. the moment. You know, it's like trying to get an extra thing into a GP appointment. You know, you're just not going to win. They've got too many things to do. Whereas the more we can do with after school clubs, with weekend activities, the brilliant kind of healthy, um, healthy active scheme that there is over the summer in the city, which produce, produces a whole range of clubs where children, young people come along and make food together, do physical activity together, happy, healthy holiday thing is brilliant. So I think, you know, I'm probably beat up schools a little bit less because I think they're under a lot of pressure for other things. I'd like healthier school catering, but I recognise how hard that's to do on a budget. But I'd also like to see better food in our care homes and I'd certainly like to see better food in our prisons. I mean, you people that are in institutions should not have to eat rubbish food. It's It's not what we should be doing as a humane society, but... You know, there's a limit to how much my influence goes. I can do what I can in Birmingham to make a difference. But I I think when it goes back to the food bank thing, you know, when you really think about what would it be like if someone took away all your ability to choose what you ate and you just had a plate put in front of you every day in which you have no choice, you know, my heart sinks at the thought of that. Would it be part of the kind of strategy to say, you know, you've got some of the food legends and superstars mm. who are part of the grant who, I mean, we spoke about urban herbs. I think part of theirs was we're going to go into schools and teach mm. kids how to grow. That's as far as it would kind of go for the, that, that, I mean, that's still pretty good if you're going to support that kind of thing. Yeah. I mean, the whole point about the food legends um, is there's, there's two kind of elements to it. So one, there are some pots of money that people have been able to apply for, and it's really been designed at, to get to small organizations, you know, people like Urban Herbs, where it's just, you know, it's a small family type business to help them engage with their community to take, get out and and be seen. Um, But the second part is to celebrate some of the brilliant people we have in the city. You know, we have some great food entrepreneurs out there. Um, We've great people doing stuff with kids. We've great people doing stuff with old people and, you know, whether they are creating affordable food cafes, um, whether they are um, creating ways for people to upcycle their food. I mean, you, we upcycle furniture like it's going, and that's the latest fan <laughs> thing to do. Yeah. And you talk about upcycling food and people are like going, oh, what's that, you know? Um, but there are all these things now, which I think food, le- if the Food Legends is around celebrating people in Birmingham who are doing brilliant stuff in the food world, and the funding stream is about helping some of that grow a little bit more, and whether that's getting people together to grow, whether it's getting people together to eat, and whether it's getting people together to create, you know, there, there are lots of opportunities. And that sits alongside but separate to the funding that we put into the food banks and the food pantries, because it was quite important that we have pumped as a council, I think over a million pounds now into the food banks over the last 18 months to support them through the cost of living crisis. But the food, food legends is more about celebration. It's about actually going, you know, there are people in the city doing brilliant stuff. And if we're able to amplify that, then that's, that helps us all move towards uh, a healthier, more delicious food city. I think uh, Pip 
Pip was part of it as well. Mm-hmm. Pip's Hot Sauce and Lil, Lil's Parlor. Mm-hmm. I think they were like doing workshops and stuff with the money as well. So mm-hmm. that, that was cool. Well, the, the workshops, are, I mean, I think we, we learned this during the Commonwealth Games as well. I mean, actually even before, some of, some of you will have seen on um, YouTube, we had a bunch of videos on the Healthy Brum channel where we got some of the chefs of the city to take store cupboard ingredients and turn them into like something delicious. I mean, I will call out Brad at Carter's who, who did this most amazing thing with the tuna tuna. But I was like, I'm sorry, how many of us have Benito flakes in the cupboard? It's not, <laughs> it's not one of my like everyday ingredients. Um, but, you know, we built on that through the Commonwealth Games and we had a series of food demonstrations uh, across the city with recipe cards, taking traditional dishes from Commonwealth countries and just tweaking them with a the nutritionist to make them a little bit healthier. The partnership we had with the Whisk uh, platform, which people can get free on their phones, you know, has over 250 recipes from across the Commonwealth that people donated. Even some of the restaurants in the city, the Coconut Tree, really fab restaurant, highly recommend it. Mm-hmm. Um, <laughs> you know, they donated a traditional Sri Lankan recipe for us and nutritionists uh, worked with us to tweak the recipes and with the Whisk platform to make them slightly healthier, but they still taste and look the same. Um, so it builds on this, you, a lot of, I think for a lot of people, if you weren't lucky enough to have a parent or a grandparent who gave you the confidence to experiment with cooking, then it's a scary place to start. And, you know, we, most kids don't get home ec in school anymore. So the more we can create ways that support people to just have a go, what's the worst you can do? You can burn it and it tastes disgusting. I mean, you know, <laughs> all of us have done disasters and giving people the confidence to go, that's okay. You know, have a go, try. Um, if it tastes disgusting, you learn and you know not to put the two things together again, but <laughs> at least you had a go. If it tastes delicious, wow, you've just invented your recipe. You're a chef. I mean, you know, and I think things like the workshops really start to give people a bit more confidence to explore a bit more. So I've got, I've got the food strategy book just next to me. Can anyone go and order it from somewhere? Or So um, it's online on the council website. Yeah. We have copies in the libraries across the city. So we don't kind of print them to order because they're quite expensive and you know, we're trying to save money for the council. It's, it's quite a hefty book. Come on, no, because I asked Bradley. <laughs> I was like, can I have a, a copy of the food strategy? Yeah. And I was expecting like an A4 pamphlet or something. And then he come and dropped his book and I was like, wow. That's a book. <laughs> well, and the, the reason it's a book and it, you know, um, when people have a look at it, you know, it's got a fist and a fork on the cover and it's called the Birmingham Food Revolution. And it is about a revolution. How do we create a revolution in our city? How do we create it together? It's got pictures of food heroes in the city, food legends in the city. And that was really important to us. You know, it has quotes from it. It was very important to me and to the politicians and, you know, now Councillor Marion Khan is my cabinet member and she's absolutely behind this. And for her, and, you know, she, she's the member for Alum Rock, you know, she goes, well, how do we make this real in Alum Rock? This is a part of the city which is full of small independent businesses. Um, you know, everyone's struggling to put food on the table. How do you make this real? So it was really important. It, it not only had good content, but it needed to look good and it needed to speak to and of Birmingham. And, and that's why it's got loads of Birmingham people in it because I did not want a Photoshop kind of pamphlet i wanted something and we wanted something that reflected that this is a strategy we've created with the city not for the city yeah i mean it, it only works if people buy into it that's the, i think having to read through it that's the main takeaway is it's it's something you've created for us but with us in mind as well yeah and it's also something that i think you know i mean i've, I've created strategies um, nationally and internationally before and my big learning was you can write a really beautiful book but it can just end up sat on the shelf um, and there's a real risk if you also you write something that only you believe in then if you go and get another job then then it'll die and one of the things we work really hard to do with the strategy is make sure that we have engaged with people it's always had a steering group which is multi-agency there are academics on it there are businesses on it 
there are charities on it, food banks on it. So that this is our strategy as a city, not my strategy as director of public health. Because if it's my strategy and I'm not here tomorrow, then it'll be consigned as pulp. My hope is that it is a document that inspires people. And and it's why it links to the the dinners we do that you came to at, at university college. You know, to achieve this, we've got to have some difficult conversations. With a, a variety of people as well. I was quite impressed because when we got the invite for the first one, I think there was a minute where we both were like, was this really meant for us? Like, <laughs> like we're just two passionate foodies, mm. you know, trying to shine a light on our hospitality yeah. scene. And we were like, and then we went to it and it was like, we were blown away how fantastic it was. Just the variety of people in the room. There was, um, I think it was obviously public health mm. and then there was a couple of uh, food inspectors. Mm. But then there was just non-academics completely and foodies just like us. And mm. I think so often with anything that's from council, it can be just an echo chamber of just intellects or just councillors and they pat each other on the back. No offence, they pat each other on the back and say, we've done a good job mm. here. And that's, <laughs> and that's as far as it gets to, never gets out into the broader communities and sadly dies away but well and the joy of the day i mean i i I think i'm so pleased we created these dinners because partially because i love going to eat at the the (laughs) the food school um but you know we each time we set the topic we challenged the students to create the menu so the very first one we did on um cost of living and food justice and we gave the students a budget i think it was four pounds 35 to create a three course meal for a family of four and they had to design and these are students that are training to be cordon bleu chefs and they were kind of going you got four pounds 35 to feed four people three <laughs> courses what you're going to do um and they came cre- created the menu and each time we set the topic we give them they they get the challenge of creating the menu they cook it and they serve it to us so it's also as well as the people that sat around the table the students that are going to to the food school are also experiencing it from the other side. And, and I think that is, that's been really exciting and interesting part of it as well. And what you may or may not have noticed is on your table, there will have been a student yeah. and they write up the discussions from over the meal. And so at the end of the year, there is going to be a report, which for each dinner summarizes what was discussed because at the end of each talk, there's a question posed for the table to kind of a bit of conversation about and the student is there capturing it. So it is also helping shape our thinking. And we really wanted it to reflect these dinners, to reflect the diversity of the city, but also to give us a space to have some of the difficult conversations. So in October, um, we're going to talk about food as a weapon of colonialism and reflect to people, you know, much of our food is built on the back of slavery. You know, that's where, that's how we have sugar. Mm. You know, the only way we have sugar in the UK comes from a history and legacy of slavery. But what we don't talk about is in today's world where companies go into countries like Fiji and basically consume all of the drinkable water to make soda, which is then exported, or move into countries like Kenya or Nigeria and introduce a different tra- strain of chicken um, because the chicken that is native isn't good for turning into a drumstick and buttering, <clears throat> battering and deep frying. We are still manipulating countries' ecologies as well as their economies in the name of food. And we need to talk about that. So, you know, but having that conversation in a lecture, and I know I sound already getting to my activist soapbox space, but <laughs> but actually having that conversation over a meal is people open up and they have really different conversations so it has been the the creative dinners I think have been really really powerful and actually have influenced the strategy I mean they are designed to help us think about how do we make this real with real people rather than just in a kind of policy think tank yeah, it's not just us that think they're great either we know a few people that have been mm. and obviously what we do we know people mm. there already and they're all blown away by him as well. Well, you met comrades and you were with mm. comrade earlier. Like comrade was like, lads, this is fantastic. Yeah. And it's been brilliant. And, and, you know, what I'm really grateful for is the speakers all give their time for free. 
Wow. You know, um, the university um, and us, we work together on funding it, but it's funded predominantly through what's called knowledge exchange money, which is money that universities can draw down to help bridge between science and research and reality. So it, it fits the bill really, really well. And we get to have a delicious meal and the students get to get a challenge. So I can't wait for the next round. <laughs> How much support is the council going to give to the to how we're going to make it real yeah, yeah yeah so um we're now one of i think about five uh, authorities in the country who have a dedicated food team so it's five members of staff who purely work on food on the food strategy and making it real and they have a relatively small budget it's about a hundred thousand hundred and fifty thousand a year uh, which comes out of public health money but that's not what's going to deliver the strategy. The strategy is delivered by the partnership. You know, that's not going to solve food waste. Mm. But already since the strategy has been written and we've had the food team in place, we've just, I mean, the impact they've had. So Rosie Jenkins in the team leads our work on food insecurity. And she led the work last year in cost of living, which in six weeks went from we should do something about how to help the food banks to money getting into the food banks to buy food. You know, that was the fastest thing the council's ever got money out the door into something that was an emergency um, in that way. Um, the work that Bradley Yacoub um, and Sarah Pullen are doing on how we move the strategy and the concepts around things like school catering. So we influenced, we changed actually the council procurement policy um, when it was going out to re-procure its food contract for the food that City Service buys because I was able to sit at the top table and go, hold on, before this goes through to the politicians for decision-making, can you please go and talk to Sarah and Bradley and make the connection? And they spent a week working with the procurement team and rewrote the policy so that it actually lives up to what we the commitments we've made. So in terms of kind of commitment, we've got staff dedicated. We've got a small amount of money, but we've also got a really passionate group of partners working with us. And that's growing as we as we move this forward. And it is also politically important. I mean, I'm really lucky mm. here and, and not all of my counterparts can say this is the politicians in Birmingham, on, on all sides, all parties get this. You know, they understand that this is not okay that in the city people can't feed themselves. And then it's not that, you know, food banks are not the answer. They're a sticking plaster. So we've got to have a different conversation. The other thing I'd say on this is, as far as I know, this is the only city in the UK and possibly in the world, actually, in which food policy sits under a director of public health. And the reason we do that is... You know, in the top five things that kill people, uh, number two, three, and four are salt, fat, and sugar. So if we don't talk about that, we're not going to save people's lives. You know, we can talk about smoking all we like, and it's really important that people don't smoke. So you know, direct public health need to say that. But you know, it, that only gets us so far. That predominantly deals with lung cancer, lung disease. If we don't talk about salt and what that does to heart, heart health, Talk about fat and what that does to bowel health and bowel cancer links, you know, um, and we talk about sugar and all of these things interconnect. So, you know, I think um, the council's put its money where its mouth is in terms of we've got a team whose job it is to make this real. We are in a unique position to make it real. But ultimately, it is our strategy as Birmingham and it's up to us as Birmingham to make it real. So it's not a fix all manual. It's a it's a catalyst to get things done through everybody, really. Yeah, and I, yeah. well, because in some of these areas there isn't an answer. You know, nobody's done it. Yeah, that's true. I mean, you know, there there are things where you get into jobs and skills, for example. No one has a nice kind of career escalator that goes, here's where you enter the food industry and this is how you become CEO of Mondelez, if that's what you want to be, or Gordon Ramsay, or whoever your chef of choice is, Glyn Pennell. I mean, you know, there's no kind of trajectory of these are the courses, et cetera, in the way that you would have in medicine, for example. Um, so some of the things we want to do, we're going to have to invent. We're going to have to 
to do them. But I mean, come on, this is the city that invented custard powder. And, <laughs> you know, it's not like we can't invent things. So I'm, I'm really hopeful. I think there's a, there's a real opportunity for Birmingham to break out and be seen as the global leader. And there are some spaces where we already are. The work we're doing on food justice internationally is now seen as like, this is what other cities are learning from. Um, but, you know, this is the time we don't want to be England's second city. We're going to be England's first yes. city when it comes to food. Is there sort of a percentage of the plan that you need to work for it to be a success? Well, I like it all to work. I mean, you know, <laughs> yeah. they, um, no, I, I don't think it works like that. I think my challenge to the team has been kind of going, okay, I want to see something moving under each pillar in the next 12 months. And some pillars we're going to be able to move faster on um, because they're easier or they're a bit more kind of straightforward and others it's going to take us a lot more time so planning and licensing for example is is difficult we've already got licensing that in the city which is what's called saturation policy so the council shouldn't approve additional new fast food outlets if more than 10 percent of shop front is already fast food outlets the problem is that only applies if it's a brand new license in what's called A5 category. A5 category is also betting shops, corner shops, range of other things. So if you take over the lease on what was a betting shop and you want to turn it into a chippy, you don't have to ask the license at their council because it's still an A5 license. Mm. So the, the saturation guidance doesn't apply because you you don't have to come back to us to apply for a new license. Now that's a national policy decision, not a local one. So we're working on other other ways we can get around that. that but that's going to be more challenging. Where there are things that I think we can do more of quicker. So um, we've got a campaign uh, on um, beans and pulses coming up at the moment, um, which is just launching about helping people be less scared of a lentil. Because you know if you haven't cooked with lentils or chickpeas or bolotti beans or cannellini beans you know there's scary stuff you intimidating know. yeah <laughs> they are. well they mm. are and, and you know i think a lot of people will just about get to a sweet corn maybe a red kidney bean and kind of go that I can, that's familiar i've seen that in the chili con carne but you go actually here's a tin of cannellini beans and they go but if you know how to use it, you can do amazing stuff with it. And actually, chickpeas like are incredible once you work out how to balance the, the potential windiness. Um, you know, all of these things <laughs> fairly affordable and highly um, yeah, like full of protein. Fiber, exactly, yeah. absolutely, protein and fiber. But even better if you can show people how to use dried chickpeas, which are phenomenally cheap you then get to even better value and, you know, and, and all you'll do is soak them overnight. So I think, and there's lots of things. I mean, I remember coming here with a kid and my, my grandmother using marifat peas. That's all I grew up on yeah. was marifat peas. Yeah. Yeah. And, and, you know, <laughs> but for a lot of people now, they go, what's that? Mm -hmm. Wouldn't see it. So, you know, there are some things in the strategy we'll be able to move faster on and things around the education space, awareness space. We've been doing work, started just before the Commonwealth Games with the Diverse Nutrition Association because we were talking to communities that were telling us, you know what, you want to tell us what healthy eating is and you've got this eat well plate, this kind of plate that shows how much should be fat and how much should be carbohydrates. But it's all white British menu. Mm. and i don't want a peanut butter sandwich you know so we've worked with the diverse nutrition association to reimagine the eat well plate but through the eyes of commonwealth countries of heritage so they've got an african um one already and a caribbean one and then there'll be a series of other commonwealth country plates that will be launched and alongside those recipes and web um, videos on how to cook the recipes so there's stuff that we'll be able to move faster on, but there's also some heavy lifting and that requires us to kind of roll our sleeves up and talk to government um, and try and influence. But, you know, Birmingham's in a good position. Second city government will have conversations with us. And, you know, we do well in partnership with people like the Food Foundation. Henry Dimbleby came here writing when he was writing the food, sorry, food strategy. And also there's people like you out there that are there helping us talk about it and you know that's really really important so I, I i'm not running a kind of trajectory of i want this and i want that what i'm saying to the team is 
work with the partnership, what I want is something under each of the pillars mm. so that we can show progress because this will only work if we move all the pillars. If we forget food waste, not going to work. If we forget to talk to farmers, it's been really interesting, you know, talking to farmers about how we relate to them from Birmingham because the initial reaction when we said we're going to food strategy was some of our neighbouring shires were like, what are you doing? You're going to mess up our economies. Mm. I'm like, no, I'm going to get people to buy from your farmers. It's a good thing. You know, wouldn't it be brilliant if we could buy directly, buy our apples from Warwickshire farmers and our broccoli from Herefordshire farmers rather than having to go through someone else? Working with the wholesale market, you know, it's an amazing gem in the city that can help us navigate some of this and look at how can we get dynamic procurement platforms that would actually help small micro agriculture sell into a wholesale market that then can reach a better audience. You know, all of these things in, and Birmingham, for me, it's about magpieing. You know, it's, it's about looking around the world. We're talking to Winhook in Namibia who've done this amazing project about helping people grow with minimal electricity, water and soil because it's Winhook is an incredibly poor city in a really inhospitable climate. And I'm like, well, if they've done it, why can't we? Mm. How can we, you know, let's be humble, let's learn from them. Mm. Because actually they've taught people to grow enough food to supplement their diet, back to that windowsill cherry tomato plant. But that's what they're doing. They're nutritionally supplementing. They know they can't feed someone to, totally from a windowsill, but they can nutritionally supplement. And that has a really important impact both on people's health, but also actually on their well-being, because you know, growing things does make a difference. Everything you're saying sounds great. Mm. Why hasn't this always been in place? Like I'm talking from the 60s, the 70s. Why isn't this just something that's always been important? Oh, so I would say um, food policy in this country, we had really good food policy after the war. We had a thing called the Ministry of Food. And I'm a big fan of the Ministry of Food. I, I think we should have a Ministry of Food again. I'd be well up for that. Um, because the Ministry of Food was established in the post-war era because people didn't know how to cook with ration books. Um, and so, and it ran cookery classes in the street and it taught people how to use their rationing and, and create nice, delicious food. And it hung around until about the 60s. And then it was, it was kind of taken apart. And then we moved into kind of what I would call the microwave era and the ready meal era. That sat alongside industrialization. So, and the kind of rise of the office worker. And then we came through that period and we moved into food as an aspirational product. And really, I would say from the 80s through to the 2000s, it was all about branded food. And that's where we got like massive amounts of food advertising on TV. What you ate became very important. We went through the era of Cordon Bleu, you know, fancy little plates of nothingness. It's only really in the post 2000s, I think we've started to have conversations about food provenance, um, the impact that food has on our environment. And we really reconnected with taste rather than style. I think it was a lot of style over substance. So that would be my kind of macro, this is why this didn't come up, is that, you know, when you look at our relationship with food, food is deeply cultural. We celebrate with food, we mourn with food, we show love with food. I mean, think about what Valentine's Day would be without any chocolate. <laughs> you, know, I mean, you know, your other halves probably wouldn't thank you for it. Um, <laughs> but it's, it's so part of cultural identity. And, and, you know, we are still one of the largest global consumers of cookbooks and, and food television against any other nation and we have been for quite a long time you look back at things like fanny craddock and then the evolution through nigella and through jamie and now into kind of cookery competitions the great british bake-off um we are a nation that's quite obsessed with food but that evolution actually tells you something about our relationship to the food strategy i think now we're in a position where we have had a couple of shocks like Ukraine that made us all think a bit more about food. I think we've got people like Henry, Dimbleby, Angela, Hartnett, um, Jamie Oliver, you, we've got big Ed Preleith, you've got TV chefs who, because they have prominence, have voice and have used that voice as a power for good, you know, and, and I think that's changed the space in which you can operate. I mean, why Birmingham, why now? 
I would say bluntly because I came into the picture and I like food <laughs> um, and I was in the right place at the right time with the right politician. Um, you know, and I think a lot of credit to Paulette Hamilton for saying, yep, just in right thing to do. Because if I had, if the politicians had said, no, don't want a food strategy, we wouldn't have one. So the political air cover is really important. There are very, very few cities that have strategies like this. You know, the big sink or swim question, you know, will, will the sea flay rise is going to be whether actually we can get the city to engage and really deliver as a partnership. This is the future of our city. I think we're playing with, you know, I, I think, and I really do believe this is in the post pandemic world, the reason people come to cities is for pleasure, for recreation. And food is really fundamental to that. Therefore, if we don't really get our heads around what a delicious, vibrant food city Birmingham can be, then the city itself will fail. Because no matter how many cars you manufacture or how many whizzy bang tech hubs you've got, if you don't have a vibrant food and hospitality sector, then come five o'clock, the lights go out. And that's not a sustainable city. And so, you know, it's for me, this is something that is tied to the future of Birmingham. And, and I think we should... We should be known as the food capital of England because where else can you within an hour, less than an hour, go from Ethiopian to an Edwardian tea room? He can do it in three blocks. Yeah. You know, that that's the joy of Birmingham. I've always said I'd like to do like a map, see how far you can get around the world just without leaving Birmingham, just yeah. through food. I think you could probably do the whole world. I, I mean, really do. Very close. I think I probably, I, I, I think I get probably a bit stuck places like Iceland. I'm not sure I found an Icelandic restaurant yet, but you know, there's a whole group of the kind of Azerbaijan type restaurants, the Central and Eastern Europeans. There's multitudes of different African restaurants. I mean, when I came to Birmingham, there, one of my friends that had moved up from London about uh, six years previously because a family had said to me, you do realize you're now going to have to relearn what a curry is. Because <laughs> in London, curry is a curry is curry. Here, you need to know whether you're ordering from a Pakistani or a Bangladeshi curry because they are quite different. And and I love that. I love the fact that from, from where I live, I've Indico and Tamatanga, which are two of my favorite Indian restaurants, um, but completely different styles of curry. Mm -hmm. And that's brilliant. And they're both authentic and they're both family run. And, you know, that that's the joy of Birmingham, you know. And well, I went down and had my first proper bull tea down in the Bull Tea Triangle for my birthday uh, a couple of months ago. And again, I, I mean, I'd never seen a nan half the size of a table before. <laughs> Not sure I quite need to see it again, but, you know, yeah. it, it was great. And, and that is the joy of the city. And that's why food is part of who we are in Birmingham. Um, but more importantly, food is part of who we are as a diverse city. You know, there isn't a dish where you go Birmingham's faggots and peas or it's steak and kidney pudding. Birmingham is world food. It's exciting food. It's different food. It's challenging food. And... That's why this strategy is so important to us as a city, because actually we've got to continue to evolve that if that is going to stay part of our identity. It's as much a bolty as it is fish and chips, you know? Absolutely. <laughs> Absolutely. And it's, you know, it's as much as chocolate as it is mm. curry powder and, uh, and custard powder. And, you know, the, knowing the history of our city, and that's the other bits that I kind of, I've loved since I moved here is, you know, we did a tour of the, the Jewelry Quarter Cemetery where the guy that invented custard powder is buried and you get the whole romantic love story of he did it for his wife who's allergic to eggs. And you just go, wow, I never knew that. I never knew that was part of this city's history. And, and the way, the whole way that Bourneville is created around the kind of Quaker ethos and Cadbury's and... Then you see Glynn's reinvention and now Brad's as well of Birmingham soup and this kind of the heritage of food in this city is part of a global heritage. Um, but it also goes back to where we started. It's part of that. It, it's part of welcoming people. You know, it's not quite like, you know, when you go to the Midwest and they feed you till you burst. But it is here people, food is part of how we express ourselves and it's part of how 
we connect and Brummies connect well um, and hence we like to be well fed. So you said about how the strategy has been well received by all parties in this building uh, and you've said that you've kind of went out but during COVID and stuff, you went out into the streets and you got to meet with mm. local real people. How would you say it's going to be received out, that, out, out in the wilderness <laughs> out with normal people? Yeah, I mean, my experience with Birmingham is everyone will be very nice and they'll say nice things, but they'll say, well, just go and deliver it first. Yeah. You know, it's it's like um, we we get this. We under, I mean, the feedback I've had from, because, you know, it, it's, we have done engagement with it. We've taken out, we've shown people that. Shown people what they contributed to. And I think that's really important is, you know, you said we did. Let us let us play back to you. You told us this in a focus group and we can show you how you made a difference. But in Birmingham, people want you to see you do it. They don't want just to see you write about it. And and that and it's why this stuff, I, I you know, I do think we've got to be better at talking about what we do, sharing it and getting it out there because the work we've done with the food banks, I mean, I'm phenomenally proud of it. And it is it's now led to a global uh, city pledge on food justice, which Birmingham has led the call for cities across the world to see food justice as a political issue for city administrations. And that sounds like real policy speak. But I've been quite amazed how few cities see it as their job to make sure that people get fed. It's really interesting. And um, and through that, we've then been working with the UN Food Security Council on this now as a global issue. But it comes from the work we did in Birmingham with the food banks, with the food pantries, who sat around a table, a virtual table, and said, this is the help we need. This is what works. This is what doesn't work. But then we went and worked with people who use the food banks and said, what's it like to live like this? And, you know, and and the... All of that is changing, not just Birmingham, but it's starting to change the world. And that that's the really exciting part of this is you know, we are having impact. But I do think we've got to be a bit better about sharing some of the impact because those people know, but people down on Broad Street won't see that. And actually, to some extent, they don't need to see it. Some of the stuff we're going to start doing with fast food outlets. I don't expect most people to go around and count the number of holes in a salt shaker. <laughs> But I know, because it's been done in places like Newcastle, um, that actually if we can pay for the salt shakers in fish and chip shops to have four less holes in them, then you will, you the way we use fish and chips, we have, we've we got this kind of automated numbers of shakes, we learn. So people, it's like how many teaspoons of sugar you put in your tea. Once you know you're like a three spoon person, you don't look at the size of the spoon and go, oh, that's a big spoon, I'll only have two, or oh, that's a little spoon, I'll have four. Same with short shakers. So what they showed was if you use, if you put fewer holes in the salt shaker, people reduce the amount of salt they use. And they still enjoy their fish and chips. They're just using half as much salt. So there are things that we would want to do that are unconscious. Doesn't stop you shaking more salt if you really, really want it. But most of us, these are unconscious things that we do. So there are some things like the food banks and stuff where I think we need to shout a bit more. And then there are other things like the salt shakers where I'm like, do you really need to know that I've blocked up three holes in your salt shaker? <laughs> it's not, I'm not removing your choice. It's not nanny state. It's about going, you know, if you really want it, shake one more time. You know, make it a conscious choice, not an unconscious one. Um, same thing when we reorder in a vending machine. We know from some of the science that if you put in a drinks a freezer cab, chiller cabinet in this corner shop and we put all the full sugar drinks at the bottom and all the no sugar drinks at the top, people will buy more no sugar drink. I mean, there was a reason why all the chocolate bars and sweets were like kids eye mm -hmm. level at the mm -hmm. tables. You know. Absolutely. We buy what's in our eye line. Um, I think there are other areas where, you know, we've got to decide how brave we're going to be. You know, if you think about a box of Cadbury um, Quality Street, the colours, there is, it's not a mistake that the colours in a box of Quality Street are the same as the colours in Tetris. Those colours stimulate our brain. So we get like a kind of adrenaline buzz from bright jewel colours. Yeah. But when you explain that, particularly when you explain teenagers, teenagers hate being manipulated. So when you kind of explain these things that are happening, the way that supermarkets stack their shelves, things that are on the end of a shelf row so that they catch your eye. 
um, people start to view them a little bit more cynically. And, and we've got to think carefully about, do we want to get into that space? Because to some extent, if we get into it, then the manufacturers will find a different way to kind of manipulate it. And at the heart of this is always that bit of, we want people to be able to afford delicious, healthy, safe food. And we've got to think really carefully to make sure that we don't destabilize the food economy, that we do this in a way with industry, with partners, and work with the city so that you know, we keep that at the heart of what we're trying to do, which is create a city in which everyone can enjoy the food that they get, that it's healthy, it's sustainable, and it's safe, because that's what we all want. So anyone who's listening who's just a normal person, they're just like really inspired by what's going on, really thinking, yeah, this is the right way to mm. go. What could they do to get involved? So um, we've got a LinkedIn group. So you can look at creating a healthy food city as LinkedIn group. Uh, healthy Brum on Twitter and social media or whatever it's called, X now. Um, <laughs> uh, you can follow us on there. We'll have a series. We, we have a series of events across the city around the food strategy. We'll be having more workshops around different work streams. But I would say certainly follow Healthy Brum at Healthy Brum is the best way to kind of connect and know what's going on. But also, if this inspires you, reach out through through the internet, look at what's going on in your local area. Food banks are desperate for volunteers. There are loads of growing projects across the city. There are lots of fabulous charities and organisations in this space. You know, if this buzzes you and you start to go, yeah, I want to be part of this, Find out what's on your doorstep and be part of changing your community because you will always be more inspired and more engaged if it's affecting you, your family, the people you care about, rather than kind of trekking up to council house, come sit in a room and listen to me waffle on. I am always blown away by the people that I meet across the city who get off their butts to make the city better for other people. So if this has inspired you, get off your butt and get out in your own community and start making a difference there. And if that's too much, start just in your own house. Get a little cherry tomato plant, plant some seeds, have a go. You know, with your niece or nephew or your grandchildren, try it. And if nothing else, just try buying a pak choy or an aubergine and <laughs> fling it about a frying pan and see what you get out the other end. Because everyone will engage with this a different way. And there's not like, here's, here's the regimented way to do it. You know, food is meant to be fun. It's meant to be delicious. It's meant to bring us comfort, joy, and happiness. So if you're inspired by this, go and find your joy in food and, and do it in a way that brings something great to the city. Amazing. I think that's a pretty good place to kind of finish yeah, up. Was there anything that you no, we haven't brought No, I covered everything pretty much. Perfect. Exactly. So, we, yeah, we usually finish on, um, I, I kind of forgot. Yeah. <laughs> Set so, of standard questions. He, he does a couple of standard questions. Just to gauge a bit more about yourself. Yeah. What's your favourite TV show? Uh, favourite TV show at Drag Race, RuPaul's Drag Race. Good choice, good choice. Your favourite movie? June, the original uh, David Lynch version. So weird, we were talking about June in the car on the way here today. Oh, it's classic. It's actually good, the original. The, origin, the original one goes on, if you watch the full extended, because it, it's the whole first book, goes on for like three and a half hours. Oh. But it's... It's just, so, I mean, the book, I read all the books as yeah. a kid. I loved them. Um, but yeah, it's amazing. The original, the, the remake's not bad, mm -hmm. but the original is definitely worth just getting the popcorn. I've heard for. bad things about it, so I'm intrigued now. Yeah. Maybe same. it's not the full version that people have. I think the problem with the original is if you're, it depends when you grew up in terms of your sci fi and your CGI. So if you, you know, I was a Clash of the Titans kid. <laughs> so that was my expectation of what special effects look like. And therefore, Dune works okay. If you were kind of post Return of the Jedi, then the CGI is a bit clunky. So then you might. The other thing is, it, you know, when it comes to science fiction, it, it's quite intellectual, June. It, you know, there's mm. a whole load of relationships and everything else. But yeah, that it got down. weird. It got a bit weird in the end. Oh yeah, it, it <laughs> yeah, definitely get, got weird. It's it weird. <laughs> yeah. Did you read the uh, prequels right by his son? Yeah, and there's a yeah. new one just about to come out. I think, oh, is there? But I haven't read it yet. Yeah. Oh, cool. I and did quite enjoy one, them, you know. Well, and also on Netflix, there it's going to be a Bene Gesserit series oh that's fantastic so that's gonna be quite cool as well they're so. very interesting there yeah okay it's funny how the world works yeah, literally talking about it, i've been yeah. waiting for that to come out but i thought it's 
it's just half the book, isn't it? Yeah, it just, and that's why the fir- the original yeah. film is better because it's the whole book. It's a bit weird. It's yeah. kind of like it's a nothingness, really. You need yeah. the whole lot. Together, it sort of really. ends as well. Just you're like, oh, but yeah. I did. I almost exactly. didn't watch it on the basis <laughs> that I needed to. The I think when the new one comes but, out, part two, yeah, it'll just be you go to the cinema and you watch. Yeah, so I've already said there's going to be cinemas. Probably the Mockingbird are going to put them both on on the same day, mm. so you can watch it all as one yeah, big film. Definitely worth doing. Do you have a cookbook that you like to cook from? Oh, uh, no, I'm trying to remember what it's called. So at the moment, I'm very into um, was it healthy meals uh, in under thirty minutes? Oh yeah. Um, just because I'm on a bit of a health drive, but my go tos used to be so Ma- I used to have Madrid Jaffrey. Indian cookbook that was about the size of the Bible yeah. that I inherited from my mum. Um, and the other thing is I collect um, LGBTQ plus cookbooks. Oh, right. So the first one I have is from 1956 and it's actually called The Gay Cookbook. Uh, it's American. It's incredible. And then I have a whole load of kind of radical lesbian cookbooks from the 80s and um, HIV fundraising cookbooks. So, yeah, and, and now I collect alongside that LGBT chefs. So... Uh, Kylie Kwong, for example, was on Australian MasterChef. So yeah, so I've got really interesting cookbook selections. <laughs> gonna say, that sounds great. Yeah. Is there any place in Birmingham you particularly like going out, eating and drinking in? Uh, so I'm a big fan of the wilderness. Yeah. I'm kind of very torn between wilderness and carters for my two kind of high-end <laughs> spots. I've Indico and Tamatanga for Indian uh, are definitely there. And actually I'm very fond of a, of a Chinese hot pot. So Heidelo or happy lamb uh, for something on the Asian side uh, there as well. Other than Birmingham, what's your favourite food destination in the world? Ooh, I like to travel a lot and I like lots and lots of different foods, but I probably say toss up between Berlin and Hanoi and Vietnam, Hanoi. Berlin has more vegan restaurants than anywhere else in the world per head of population. And we had some of the most amazing vegan food there. And then Vietnamese food I just love. And Hanoi was phenomenal. So, yeah, it would be a bit of a... It's, it's like Asian, Asian vegan food in Berlin because there's lots of other brilliant food in Berlin versus just having Vietnamese forever, which I could quite happily do. Awesome. Brilliant. Thank you so much for your time. Like, absolutely honoured to have you on the podcast. It's been pleasure. awesome. Absolute pleasure. Thank you.